and welcome to this very special edition of Arirang News Center coming to you live from Davos, Switzerland. I'm Moon Gan Young. Now, as you can see right behind me, this is not Seoul, right? This is Davos, Switzerland, where the 46th World Economic Forum kicked off today on this Wednesday. Now, for the rest of this week up until Saturday, our news center will come to you live from Davos, so stay tuned to that. Now, before we delve into uh, further stories from Davos, let's check in with our Seoul studio with our Daniel to get a check on the day's top stories. Daniel? Well, thanks, Kanyang. Do help yourself to some very expensive coffee there to keep warm. We'll need you for two more days there. Well, let's begin with the latest uh, policy briefing here in South Korea. At the nation's top office and the government's third policy briefing session with President Bakane, related ministries pledged to do more to help college graduates in these tough economic times, with President Bak calling on all members of society to share the burden. Our Song ji starts us off. Improving quality of life, making people happier. That was the core of the government's third policy briefing for 2016. The session focused on creating new jobs for Korea's young people and providing customized welfare for all so that no one is left out. The government's labor and education reforms will continue, with universities reducing their admissions quotas and vying to better match the needs of students and employers. Given the current state of the labor market, President Buck called on labor and management to yield and sacrifice in equal measure. <laughs> Her remarks follow the announcement on Tuesday by the Federation of Korean Trade Unions that is withdrawing from a tripartite deal struck with the government and management in September. The deal was aimed at making Korea's labor market more flexible through a wage peak system and other measures. The umbrella union said the government had unilaterally pushed for reforms and drafted guidelines to make layoffs easier without consulting the union. Meanwhile, with youth unemployment topping 9 percent last year, the government had boosted this year's budget for youth job creation by 20 percent to 1.8 billion U.S. dollars. As part of the plan, the so-called employment zones will be set up at the country's 17 innovation centers nationwide to help young job seekers find matching positions. In addition, related ministries pledged to do more to help citizens in regions outside of Seoul. To provide citizens with customized welfare, regional community centers will be revamped into welfare hubs for local residents. President Buck asked local officials to better listen to residents' concerns so that their needs can be reflected in the government's plans. Song ji Arirang News. And in light of recent terror attacks around the world, the Korean government once again urged the parliament to approve a counter-terrorism bill that's still stuck at the National Assembly. Our Shin Se-min reports. The National Police Agency has joined the government's efforts to beef up Korea's counterterrorism initiatives. Speaking at a special government and ruling party consultative meeting at the National Assembly on Wednesday, the nation's police commissioner said the organization will turn its 140,000 officers into agents trained in counterterrorism techniques. We will disperse the manpower to regions prone to security breaches and threats. We will also boost security on the cyberterrorism front. The police chief added that seven SWAT teams and 276 police units will be stationed around the country as emergency counterterrorism units. The move follows a report by the National Intelligence Service saying it has deported 51 foreign nationals over the past five years for suspected ties to terrorist groups. Of them, seven people who had worked in Korea are reported to have joined ISIS after their deportation. In line with these efforts, the government has reiterated its call on the National Assembly to approve a counterterrorism bill aimed at protecting the public. Pointing to the recent suicide bomb blast in Jakarta, Indonesia, Seoul's second vice foreign minister, Cho Taehyung, said the ability to detect and prevent terror threats is crucial to handling similar attacks. 
The attack in Indonesia is considered the first in Asia, carried out by Islamic State militants, raising concerns about the possibility of similar attacks in Korea. The future of the counterterrorism bill is uncertain, given that it is just one of many bills waiting for the parliamentary approval as the two main political parties iron out their differences. But in the meantime, there are concerns that Korea could be leaving itself open to vulnerabilities in its national security system. Shin Se-min, Arirang News. A senior U.S. diplomat is in Seoul to discuss a coordinated response to North Korea for its latest nuclear test. For more, we turn to Connie Kim. Connie, I understand that several uh, top American officials have been in Seoul for nuclear talks this month. Right, Daniel, that shows South Korea's and the United States' determination to bring out a strong and comprehensive U.N. Security Council resolution on North Korea. The two nations have also been united in calling on China to play an active role in punishing the North. U.S. Deputy Secretary of State Tony Blinken met with South Korean Foreign Minister Yoon Byung-hae and Vice Foreign Minister Im Sung-nam in Seoul on Wednesday. The three reaffirmed their commitment to a strong and comprehensive U.N. resolution on North Korea following its fourth nuclear test this month. This is a North Korea versus international community. So they understand that uh, seriously how their wrong behavior will make them uh, feel miser miserable. Since North Korea's provocation, members of the six-party denuclearization talks have held a series of meetings to discuss possible countermeasures against the regime. That's up the pressure on China, North Korea's close ally, to play a leading role in sanctioning Pyongyang, especially given its special relationship with Beijing. It has more influence and more leverage over North Korea than any other country because virtually all of North Korea's trade goes to, from, or through China. So we are looking to China uh, to show leadership on this issue. Blinken is expected to press the issue when he meets with his Chinese counterpart, Jiang Yisui, on Thursday. U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry is also expected to make his own pitch when he visits China next week. South Korea's foreign ministry is also making its final push for a stronger sanctions resolution during meetings with members of the U.N. Security Council this week. As the meetings proceed, the focus of question will be what level of sanctions China is willing to impose on its traditional ally. Daniel? Thank you for that, Connie. Moving on, a senior U.S. missile defense official says North Korea has not increased its nuclear capabilities despite its latest nuclear test earlier this month. Vice Admiral James Serring, director of the U.S. Missile Defense Agency, said Tuesday that the North's technical capability has not improved but did not elaborate on the basis of its assessment. Serring added that the U.S. has taken steps to stay ahead of the North's nuclear threat and is monitoring its actions. He also said the North's recent test has not changed the agency's missile defense program. North Korea conducted its fourth nuclear test on January 6th, claiming it was a successful test of a hydrogen bomb. U.S. experts have expressed doubts about the claim. And now I toss it over to Davos, where some of the biggest names and the brightest minds have gathered, the present company, of course, included. Kanyo? Right, Daniel. Well, don't go anywhere because we will check back with you for more news updates from Seoul. Now, as you can see, Davos is a ski resort town. You can see the picturesque uh, view right behind me. Well, Davos, this time of the year, roughly 2,500 global leaders gather in this small town. This is a town population of 11,000 normally. Well, um, it gets very crowded for roughly four to five days this time of the year, every year for the World Economic Forum. It's um, usually referred to as Davos Forum. So let's find out what World Economic Forum is all about. Our Kim Min-ji is standing by outside the venue on the streets of Davos. Uh, Min-ji, could you give us a brief history of the World Economic Forum? Kanyang, the independent non-profit foundation was founded by German economist Klaus Schwab back in 1971 as a European management forum. It became the World Economic Forum in 1987 when it aspired to reach beyond the continent where it got its start. Over time, the meeting has evolved in both size and scope. 
There were just 440 participants from 30 countries at the first event. Now there are more than 2,400 participants with a guest list that includes more than 40 world leaders, a thousand chief executives and a sprinkling of Nobel laureates and celebrities. The economy-focused gathering has also expanded its mission. Today, the WEF is committed to improving the state of the world by engaging business, political and other leaders of society to shape global, regional and industry agendas. The high-profile participants will gather for sessions on global security, public health, education, gender parity and climate change and, of course, a good amount of networking. After the serious discussions during the day, participants will have a chance to rub shoulders with their global counterparts during cocktail parties outside the main venue, the Davos Congress Center. So what can we expect from this year's event? Well, we'll have to see, as every year there's always last-minute announcements, surprise visits, as well as talks between the attendees that tend to provide the world with the headlines. Well, Minji, uh, make sure you do stay warm out there and we look forward to more reports from you. Now, earlier today, well, less than an hour ago, Arirang TV hosted a televised debate right here at the World Economic Forum, moderated by myself. Um, the topic was artificial intelligence. Our Kwon Tua has a rundown of what the session was all about. Artificial intelligence is one of the hot topics being discussed and experienced at Davos this year. Given its relevance to the 2016 World Economic Forum's theme, Mastering the Fourth Industrial Revolution. On Wednesday, Arirang TV, Korea's only global network, partnered up with the Davos Forum, hosted a session called The State of Artificial Intelligence with a panel of four that turned into a lively debate between two experts in the field, Professor Andrew Moore and Professor Stuart Russell and two business leaders, the president of Chinese internet company Baidu and the executive vice president of American telecommunications company Qualcomm. The four discussed how smart artificial intelligence is, offered predictions on what the next game changers in the industry will be, and debated whether the world is ready for the rapid technological advancements on the horizon. So if AI, uh, as seems to be happening, uh, can uh, amplify our intelligence, can provide tools that make us, in effect, much more intelligent than we have been, uh, then we could be talking about, you know, a golden age for humanity. Kwon Soa, Arirang News, Davos. Well, um, one of our panelists joins us right here, live from Davos, from our new studio, Professor Andrew Moore, Dean of uh, Computer Science uh, at Carnegie Mellon University, joins me. Uh, thank you for joining me again. Thank you. Now, um, so we, you and I talked about artificial intelligence during our Adidang TV session, and um, we discussed how the state of artificial intelligence as it stands today. Let's briefly talk about that. So I think some of the things which are going on right now are that computers are beginning to understand emotions in humans. And so that's been one of the big themes you've seen here at Davos is folks talking about what it means for uh, AIs to be able to react when you show emotion, look stressed, look happy. And uh, I think this is going to lead to many new applications. Right. So. Um what kind of near-term applications are we talking about? Uh, what can we expect this year in 2016? We know that 2015 was a breakthrough year for artificial intelligence. In 2016, what should we look forward to? Well, there's many things. Self-driving cars are progressing nicely. Uh, and what you're going to look for there is a lot of research on cars on low-speed, cluttered roadways instead of the easy stuff, which is on big freeways. Another big theme that's happening at the moment is AI safety. When you've built an autonomous system, a robot or a, uh, something giving medical advice, it's got to work. And so many companies are now investing seriously in the safety teams behind their AI systems. What about in, in everyday applications? What are some of, uh, some, I guess, AI products or developments that you find most uh, efficient or effective for our daily lives? And what are some areas that you're a little bit concerned about? Good question. So I think uh, we've all got used to using our cell phones to ask, to ask simple questions. Much more of that will be 
talking to your phone. And in 2015, the questions got more advanced. Uh, 2016, you're going to start asking questions like, uh, is it normal that I'm coughing so often? And then by 2017, 2018, we'll really be asking some personal, interesting questions, such as, you know, this rash just isn't going away. What should I do about it? And that's both exciting because it, I think we're going to get much value out of this, but it's also interesting that we're going to be revealing so much of what we're thinking and what we're worried about to uh, computers at large. Well, um, at Davos this year, um, at the World Economic Forum this year, I think artificial intelligence is one of the really uh, big pillars of what makes fourth industrial revolution, which is a theme this year at WEF. Um, how do you see AI or artificial intelligence playing out in the whole, the bigger picture of fourth industrial revolution? Well, I think it's, uh, it's helping to free up people from doing the boring parts of their jobs. And you're seeing this happen a great deal. We've seen it in the legal industry where five years ago, only 5% of the background work was done by computers. Now it's up to 50% of the background uh, work done by lawyers is actually computerized. And this trend is increasing. And it's the boring part of their work. Same in, in uh, other management areas or in areas of medicine. The computers are taking over the boring parts of the work so that we can be freed up for more creative thinking. Uh, but that would cre that would create a massive layoff, so a wipeout of a whole sector of employment, right? Um, medical sector is one, but when we go back and, and think about autonomous cars, for instance, taxi drivers, I don't think we'll see them, any one of them, um, existent in, in the next, I'm going to say, very safely, 50 years, right? Um, then that would cause a social problem, would it not? Yes, this is something we're going to have to address. And in other revolutions, uh, we, no long, we no longer have chimney sweeps. We no longer have people taking care of the horses in the stables. Uh, and at the time, that might seem like a terrible thing, but the world has evolved. Nowadays, you have people who are professional social media critics. You have people who devote their life to expressing information visually on websites. And uh, we've typically seen in these revolutions, new jobs come in where other ones move out. The long term, I'm less worried about, but there will be disruption where everyone's going to be having to be re-educated uh, in the short term. And by the way, if you're a kid, you've got to get into computer science. Right. So if you're a kid, are you uh, teaching your son computer science? Yes, my, my <laughs> son and my daughter both love it. And uh, it's, it's a very interesting time because uh, it almost feels like the magic of the Harry Potter world, the fact that you can actually do these magical things writing at your home computer program to check to see if the car's pulled up in the driveway or not. Right. Fascinating. I should uh, start learning computer science myself, um, even though it might be a little late. Never. Never too late. Never, never. Um, what about, let's uh, try to make a link between artificial intelligence and ICT, information communications technology, because to an average person, it's a little bit difficult to make that direct connection. So in ICT, there's, you can see how all of society, including things like the transportation of food and logistics, the uh, making sure that the trains and freeways run on time, and your cities are smart and watching out for upcoming traffic jams and things like this. This is what it's all bringing together, is the technology and the networking, the sensing, and then the intelligence behind these, uh, designed to just make the inconvenient parts of life or the dangerous parts of life more convenient, safer. The AI part of this is really what's going on in the central processing units of the machines which are connected to everything. ICT in general is the job of actually connecting all the sensors in our cities together. Well, speaking of ICT, Korea is, is a country that is, we would like to say, among the, the front runners uh, in the ICT sector, and we've devoted our, a lot of our efforts into it. How do you see the future of ICT and plus Korea on that board? Let me first say, Carnegie Mellon University uh, is, in my belief, one of the preeminent universities in artificial intelligence. We have over 500 faculty and students working in that area, and we regard technology coming out of Korea, uh, including KAIST, as seriously competitive. And in fact, you guys beat us thoroughly in the DARPA Grand Robot Challenge, and we, we hold no grudge. We're just excited to see this strong technology partnership. So we have very great respect for this. One of the things which uh, we're anticipating happening is that uh, 
technology which used to only exist in places like Google and Microsoft, uh, it is actually quite easy for folks doing startups to access that technology. And so it's a perfect time to be entrepreneurial and looking at new ways that computer vision or speech understanding can open up new industries. This is the time for entrepreneurs. Right, and, and we look forward to much more advancements in AI, ICT, in, in computer science in the future. Professor Andrew Moore, thank you so much for speaking with us today um, following our session. Thank you. All right, well, uh, that was our discussion with uh, Professor Andrew Moore of Carnegie Mellon University. And now I want to check back with our Daniel Che in the Seoul studio for the rest of the day's stories. Daniel. Well, Ganyang, it clearly means that if we dwell too much on the past and present, we'll be lost in the future, according to the professor. Well, that's sidestep from Davos for other stories that's grabbing our attention in and out of Korea. First of all, Asian stocks face another rough day as oil prices hit a 12-year low, fueled by fears of economic slowdown in China and the addition of Iranian crude to the markets. Oh Soo Young has the numbers. On Wednesday, Korea's benchmark Kospi fell 2.3 percent, falling under the 1,850-point mark as heavy sell-offs continued. It was the biggest daily percentage loss in five months. Japan's Nikkei fared worse, shedding 3.7 percent, its sharpest one-day drop since last September. The Shanghai Composite Index also closed down 1 percent. The plunge in Asian markets came after a dismal forecast on global oil prices not investors' confidence. Concerns about oil prices intensified as trading rates remained below a 12-year low. February contracts for West Texas Intermediate plunged 3.3 per cent to $28.46 a barrel on Tuesday, the lowest level since 2003. The biggest punch came from the lifting of international sanctions on Iran. Starting in February, when Iranian oil fully hits the market, it should add to the ongoing supply glut and prices are likely to drop even further. And as the Chinese economy slows, its trade partners are also affected, further reducing the global demand for oil. Underscoring the depth of the problem, experts say the global oil glut will last into late 2016. Oh Soo-young, Arirang News. Korea's top Bloomberg's list of the 50 most innovative economies for the third straight year. Factors like boosted R&D spending helped it stay competitive. But in terms of labor reforms, it seems the country still has a long way to go. Hwang Jie shows us where Korea stands in the global playing field. Korea dominated Bloomberg's 2016 Innovation Index, topping the group of 50 countries that were surveyed. Germany took second place, while Japan, the United States and China trailed behind. The index scored countries using factors like spending on research and development, concentration of high-tech public companies and patent activity. Korea fared well in manufacturing value-added, high-tech and R&D density, as well as tertiary efficiency, which gauges enrollment in higher education. But the Bloomberg report also shows that Korea is having a hard time realizing new technologies into actual products. It cites the country's startup environment, where engineers or scientists prefer to work with big conglomerates rather than venturing out to set up their own firms. On top of that, the report says the rigid labor market, represented by wages based on tenure and seniority, is dulling the advantages Korea can take from innovative behaviors. In fact, Korea's ranking for labor productivity stood at 39th. It's an issue the finance ministry has pledged to improve through labor reforms and active utilization of the country's creative economy centers to nurture more startups. Hwang Jie, Arirang News. Going back to a story that's somewhat related to our session by Arirang at Davos, robots. They may be overseeing our work in just two years' time. According to U.S.-based IT consulting firm Gardner, more than three million human workers will be supervised by robots come the year 2018. Gardner says robots are more efficient and can evaluate employees more objectively than their human counterparts. Gardner also predicts that more of our work will be data intensive and says that within the same time frame, 20 percent of all business documents such as market data and legal files will be completed by robots. 
A group of Islamist militants stormed a university in Pakistan today and shot and killed around 20 people. Local police said the men began firing on security guards, students and teachers early Wednesday morning at Bachar Khan University in the northwestern city of Charsada. The men had rifles and wore suicide bomb vests and scaled the walls around the school to get on campus. Military troops responded quickly and reportedly killed four of the assailants. The Pakistani Taliban has claimed responsibility for the attack. The university is about 50 kilometers from Peshawar, where 141 people, mostly children, were killed in a similar attack by the same Taliban group just over a year ago. Former Alaska governor and 2008 U.S. vice presidential candidate Sarah Palin has endorsed Republican presidential frontrunner Donald Trump. At a rally at Iowa State University on Tuesday, Palin asked the crowd in her own words if they were ready to stump for Trump and said she was proud to endorse the billionaire property developer. The endorsement comes less than two weeks before the February 1st caucuses in Iowa, where Palin has spent years building support. Trump said he was greatly honored to receive her support, calling Palin a respectable friend and a high-quality person. The endorsement will be followed by a joint appearance on Wednesday in Oklahoma. Ted Cruz, Trump's chief rival, said he will remain a big fan of Palin regardless of what she decides to do. Plastic transform manufacturing, packaging and storage. But a lot of discarded plastic ends up at sea, poisoning the planet's waters. Song jang -in shares with us a new report that shows the pollutant will overtake the amount of fish in the ocean in just a few decades' time unless drastic measures are taken. Oceanographers come across an adult sea turtle. They find something that has been clogging its nostril. When they manage to pull it out, they see it's a plastic straw. Unfortunately, there's a lot of contamination in the ocean. Sea creatures that eat the garbage become sick. They lose their sense of direction and wash up on the seashore. Some 150 million tons of plastic waste is estimated to be floating in our oceans, with an additional 8 million tons making into the water every year. The World Economic Forum has forecast that at the current pace, there will be more plastic than fish in the world's oceans by 2050. According to its report published on Tuesday, the main problem is that plastic is often disposed of after only being used for a short amount of time and is not properly recycled. In fact, only 5 percent is effectively reprocessed, while the remainder ends up in landfills and oceans. The report says that tackling the problem requires the joint efforts of consumer goods companies, plastic packaging producers, authorities that manage waste, and policymakers. Plastic is one of the world's most popular materials, and its use has increased 20-fold over the past 50 years, with the rate only expected to multiply in the coming decades. The WEF says solutions need to be found quickly to avoid an ecological disaster. Some options include offering people incentives to recycle plastic and encourage countries to improve their waste collection infrastructure. Son Jong-in, Arirang News. It was another chilly day here in Seoul. Let's connect to our weather center for some updates with our Lee Ji-yeon. Ji Hello, Daniel. But, you know, compared to yesterday, sensory temperatures were higher, hovering near minus 10 degrees Celsius all day long. But it's not just Korea that's being gripped by a cold snap. Other parts of the world, including the eastern U.S., northern Europe and uh, the parts of Asia are also feeling a deep freeze, I heard. That's right. Well, weather experts are saying this phenomenon is associated with the plunging polar vortex. Now, uh, polar vortex is a large pocket of very cold air which sits over the polar region during the winter, but it has been sweeping down, pushing widespread cold to many parts of the country, including here in the Korean Peninsula. And it's forecast to be quite cold till early 
early next week, but conditions on Thursday will ease up slightly. A cold wave advisory here in Seoul has been lifted, but cold wave alerts remain in place for other parts of the peninsula. So on that note, let's move on to tomorrow's temperature readings. Daily low here in Seoul will kick off at minus 10 degrees Celsius, minus 6 for Daegu, and Busan will kick off at minus 3. Afternoon highs will be slightly higher with a high of minus 3 here in Seoul, 2 for Daegu and 4 over in Busan. Now it seems like this severe cold snap will hit its peak on Sunday with the low plunging to minus 16 degrees Celsius here in Seoul, so be prepared. Now that's Korea for you and here's a look at the weather conditions around the world. Now before I go over in Davos where the World Economic Forum has kicked off, cold winter conditions are in full effect as well. Uh, with flurries of snow expected today and the mercury will top out at minus 1 degrees Celsius. But tomorrow will be brighter but colder uh, with a low of minus 12 and a high of minus 2. Now this has been EGN with your weather. Well, I can tell you really from my own experience that it is very cold here and snowy. Like you can see right behind me, it's a beautiful snow-capped uh, Swiss Alps town of Davos right here. Well, this is a very small town of 11,000, like I said, and usually around the year, it's a, it's a very quiet town where people come to ski and snowboard. But it's this time of the year that this place gets very crowded and all the spotlight is on Davos. Davos is also the highest city in Europe, which means it's way up in the Swiss Alps. Our Kim Min Ji actually checked out the town itself and she brings us this report from Davos, the town. It's a small snowy town in the Swiss Alps, home to a well-heeled population of 11,000 people. During the winter, Davos is filled with skiers traversing the powdery slopes as it's also home to one of the world's most famous ski resorts. In January, it's freezing cold with sub-zero temperatures throughout the day, so wherever you go, people are dressed in winter gear and snow boots to trudge through the snow. My, uh, yes, it's my home, yeah, so it's for me very special. And what's very beautiful is you have snow, you have different seasons, you have summer, you have winter. I think that is very special, that's what we... But Davos is better known as the host of the World Economic Forum. Preparations have been underway for months with security tightened around the venue leading up to the event. Uh, it's, uh, it's not always. It's uh, to World Economy Forum is uh, uh, for the terrorists and is the, the police here. Yes, it's for, uh, for, um, uh, for uh, the, the people, security. That's definitely the case as world leaders, business chiefs, politicians and celebrities will be in town. In fact, while the permanent population stands at some 11,000, that number swells to around 30,000 during the foreign period when all delegates get here. But how do they get here? As for transportation, there are various ways attendees or tourists can get here. Private jets or helicopters, luxury limousines or buses. The train is also an option and I'm here at one of the closest stations to the venue. 
To get around Davos, people with the right security passes can make use of the shuttle buses provided by the World Economic Forum. And for those traveling by bus or rented cars, you may want to head out a little early, as it can get pretty congested around the venue. Kim Minji, Arirang News, Davos. Well, out of those options, transportation options, I can tell you I did not get here on a helicopter or private jet. So I'll leave it up to you. Um, so this uh, town of Davos, the World Economic Forum, the 46th one of its kind, is taking place. And today was the first day of the four-day event. The uh, theme might have been uh, Fourth Industrial Revolution, and a lot of the topics covered here, Fourth Industrial Revolution, um, technology, refugees, global security, and even cancer, as addressed by uh, U.S. Vice President Joe Biden before. The, the actual conversation is centered around China's the Chinese economic slowdown, as well as super low oil prices. So the global economy is also taking center stage, and we will have more reports on that, as well as more reports on the fourth industrial revolution, and all the more fun from Davos as well. Well, that is a wrap from Davos, um, from me, uh, for Agyang News Center today. But join us again tomorrow, this time 10 p.m. Korea time and 2 p.m. right here in Davos, for another edition of Arirang News Center, live from Davos. See you then.